All right, everybody, welcome and thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Slay at Home series. This is presented by Weston. Um, we've got a lot of great topics that have been going on um, for over the past couple of years. All of our Slay at Home episodes are available on our YouTube channel, also on the Knowledge tab on our website. So if you haven't checked out all the past episodes of the Slay at Home series, make sure you check those out. Tonight, we've got an awesome uh, topic. We'll be going over ski and splitboard mountaineering, uh, really how to start tagging peaks like a pro. We've got our wonderful guide partner, Golden State Guiding, here today. Uh, they offer all kinds of fantastic programs over in California, from rock climbing to backcountry skiing and snowboarding. So if you're ever in that area or you're tuning in from California, make sure you check those out. I am Ben. I'm the brand experience manager here at Wesson. I manage all of our guided programs, our educational programs, our events, um, really just kind of dabble in everything. Uh, I've been taking people into the woods professionally as a guide for over a decade, um, and that's really what I love. So any questions for me, feel free to hit me up on my Instagram page uh, or shoot me an email. Happy to answer those. Quick reminder, too, if you have questions this evening, post them down there in the chat. So let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you have questions. Our guides on the call this evening will field those questions and we're happy to answer them. We're also going to have a Q&A at the very end. So feel free to just type them in as they come up, though. Our first presenter tonight, we have Trevor Husted. Trevor, buddy, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. We really appreciate you being here. Let the crew know a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hey everyone. My name's Trevor uh, Husted. I've been guiding since about 2016. Um, my mode of transportation is skis and splitboard, mainly splitboard. So um, I'll try to pretend like I know what I'm talking about with skis. But um, yeah, really um, psyched to be here to get, introduce you guys into um, ski splitboard mountaineering. It's something that I enjoy doing, and it's uh, something that kind of like I feel can help elevate our game um, in the backcountry. So um, yeah, super excited to share with you all our knowledge. Killer, Trevor, where are you tuning in from tonight, buddy? Uh, I'm here in Lake Tahoe, California. Right on, man. Right on. What uh, what guide ops do you work for? Do you just work for Golden State Guiding, or are you kind of moonlight with a few other places? Um, yeah, so I work with Alpenglow um, in Tahoe. I work with um, Tahoe Mountain School. I work with uh, Shasta Mountain Guides as well, Alpine Ascents. Um, I'll be up in Alaska this year in Valdez doing some heli ski uh, with an ops called Pulse Line. And uh, I think that's it. A few others probably that I forgot, but um, yeah, that's the majority of the, the organization. Awesome. I work awesome, with. buddy. Well, thanks. Thanks for being here, man. We really do appreciate it. Of course. We've also got Will Sperry here this evening, uh, another one of our fantastic California guide team members. Will, thanks so much for tuning in, buddy. Uh, tell the crowd uh, a little bit about yourself. What's happening, gang? Um, also, Trevor didn't give himself enough credit. He's also a very talented writer, and uh, that's his like 18th job that he does. He's a world traveler and half the stories you wouldn't believe that he tells. So he's a good dude to have on the chat. Um, but yeah, my name is Will Sperry. Uh, I'm also tuned in from Lake Tahoe, more specifically in the Truckee area. Um, been guiding for like six years or so and love split boarding. I uh, don't ski like Trevor. He's a, he's, he has um, both tools at his disposal, but I am strictly a split boarder. Um, and yeah, just love, love putting sharp stuff on my feet and getting in rad places. So psyched to give this talk tonight. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here tonight. We're going to go over a lot of different topics. You know, first of all, what is ski and split board mountaineering and, and why perhaps we should get into it? We'll go over, you know, different terrain selections, what really defines, uh, you know, mountaineering versus your, your kind of normal skiing and snowboarding in the backcountry. Briefly, we'll touch on trip planning. We'll definitely um, hit some required skills and, you know, additional education that we recommend. We'll discuss fitness levels. And then, you know, a lot of this will be kind of a gear discussion. Um, any other questions you guys have, feel free to put them down here in the chat. Um, and again, we'll have a nice Q&A at the end of the discussion. So thanks for tuning in. So first off, you know, what is ski mountaineering, right? What is the big difference here? You know, when I was first kind of 
saw people rappelling into lines and carrying ice axes on the trail, I was just like, what is going on with this? So, you know, Trevor, uh, if you would kind of tell us a little bit about ski mountaineering, kind of what that really means to you. Yeah, for me, I, I think it's a bit about just experiencing the, the mountains in a different way. You know, um, at home here, most of the time we're out just kind of touring around, but um, kind of as Will mentioned earlier, it's like putting sharp stuff on your on your feet and um, carrying an ice axe, getting into areas that um, maybe push your boundaries a little bit, but also kind of like um, allow you to kind of explore a little bit more, you know, it might be a little bit more intense, but, um, I feel like it's a really fun way to just get like a lot of lawn days in the field where you get lawn descents as well too. Um, and it allows us to like kind of push ourselves mentally and physically. And, um, I think that's why it's, it's so much fun for me is just being able to kind of do these feats that you kind of don't really get to do on a daily basis. And so I feel like it's a, for me, that's kind of what it is, is just experiencing the mountains in a, in a whole other way. Yeah. I was going to say, it's like, uh, you know, mountaineering, but better. Because <laughs> instead of walking downhill, we get to ride downhill. And uh, some of the coolest places I've been and some of the best sunrises and sunsets I've ever seen have been ski mountaineering on various mountains. Um, yeah, just a cool place to explore and uh, access positions in terrain that you wouldn't otherwise be able to be in um yeah one thing to touch on here is like most of the time you wait a whole season or multiple seasons to take off lines that you're looking at from a ski mountaineering perspective um if you're really tuned into the snowpack you know it's it's a this really fleeting amazing feeling to be able to take a line midwinter but the likelihood of that is very very low and most of the time we're riding in the spring for ski mountaineering. Yep. Awesome. Thanks guys. Um, yeah. And I would, I would second that, you know, these, these skills just allow you to get into other places, right. To go beyond the, the typical spots where, you know, maybe a decade ago we were the only people on the skin track and, and now they're, it's getting busier and busier and busier, but you know, when you're getting into ski mountaineering, it's, you do find these really special places out, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere, which is kind of why a lot of us do this, right? So terrain and trip planning, you know, Trevor, I'll kind of kick it to you to discuss the differences, you know, in terrain and trip planning that might go into, uh, you know, planning out a ski mountaineering trip, something versus, you know, your standard day in the woods. Uh, real quick, this is one of our, uh, another one of our team riders, Pat Gephardt. This guy is pretty much always on a rope in the backcountry. So, he was uh, a little bit of inspiration behind this presentation. So he's another local Colorado guy. Uh, some of you may know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, jumping into train and, and, and trip planning, it's um, a little bit different in the sense that when you get into doing like ski and splitboard mountaineering, you're dealing with a lot of lawn approaches, right? Like a lot of times we're looking at something like I always think every time on Rainier, it's like, it looks like it's just right there. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, another, you know, six to eight hours later, you know, probably even more, you're reaching the, the summit. And so um, a lot of what we do when we get into, um, you know, skiing and splitboard mountaineering involves a lot of planning, right? We're talking about high mountain summits, long approaches, um, and we're exerting ourselves a lot. So it, I really think that putting a lot of planning into it can be super beneficial, um, a lot of times, you know, most of the guides that I know use Caltopo and Gaia. Um, you've got other things like Avenza. I know that nowadays there's another app called OnX. Some people use Fat Maps. And basically, you can kind of plan your approaches and in, in, um, bring them into Google Earth as well. So you can turn it into a KML file. And that way you can get a real good idea of like the terrain that you're getting into, right? There's a lot of really awesome guidebooks out there. Um, as well that kind of delve into a little bit more what's going on when you're approaching these zones and maybe certain things to look out for. Um, I know for me, a big thing when I'm doing ski mountaineering is I want to be approaching typically the way that I'm going to be skiing down, right? Um, in that photo there, I'm pretty sure that's, I think that might be red slate um, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, a lot of times the problem with approaching from the top is you have no idea of what you're getting into if you're like skiing a cool or something. So you could end up on like super firm ice. So a lot of times if I have the option to kind of boot up a cool I will. 
Um, obviously, when you get into like glaciated terrain, like thinking about potentially, you know, the danger of cracks and falling into cracks, right? Um, so that's something you have to take into consideration. And um, I know you mentioned too that we have a, a, a how to plan a backcountry trip as well um, there, Ben, as well. Yep. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, you know, on actual trip planning, we're not going to go over that a ton in this actual episode, but uh, we've got a solid hour and a half presentation on how to plan a backcountry trip. We teach you how to use all of those features um, and apps and all kinds of good things that Trevor just mentioned. Uh, a lot of them are come in handy, um, but there's a ton of other things to learn. So definitely recommend checking that out as well. Um, so some basic yeah. skills. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can we go back to that real quick? I just want to add something here. Um, so I think uh, with ski mountaineering, like it's a super like hype uh, sport right now, you know, like Cody Townsend's got like the 50 project where he's taking off like the 50 classic ski descents, which is awesome. And his project is super cool, but Cody's like a pro skier who's been doing it forever. And this is kind of like, will be seen as the pinnacle of his career if he pulls it off right and so i think it's really easy to look at these you know youtube videos of really sick objectives and kind of see them as not as serious as they might be so in the terrain and trip planning section here i want to just add a note about progression in the terrain that you're accessing right like don't go try to ski the grand for the first ski mountain trip you ever do right like um just go out into your local zone with some ski crampons and some real crampons and practice right like get in that low consequential terrain where it's where it's not a big deal if you mess up and then slowly build your terrain and objectives on you know months and years of experience definitely for sure absolutely Point well cool that's it <laughs> nice. Sweet. so we'll kind of go over and we'll touch on you know those skills here in a second too but just as far as basic skills you know ski mountaineering is not your first step into the backcountry kind of like uh what will was just saying here so you know the basic stuff um you know will do you want to kind of cover these basics of what kind of you recommend someone should, should already have under their belt before they're really looking to dive into ski mountaineering yeah absolutely um i think paramount to any backcountry skiing or snowboarding is being a intermediate advanced to expert rider. Like that's kind of like number one in my book for where to start. Um, once you're a good rider, then, you know, spend a few seasons just out touring around, getting used to your gear, getting used to layering, like how do your clothes work? How do you, what kind of food do you like to eat throughout the day? How much water do you need? Just kind of all of these like almost soft skills to being a good split tour or uh ski tour um and just like build that that uh wide base of foundational knowledge um so yeah confident with your your touring setup know your gear know how to fix your gear because typically when you're ski mountaineering you're going farther and there's more stuff in your kit so more stuff to break potentially um be dialed on your backcountry navigation, understand avalanche terrain. Um, obviously, snow safety and rescue skills are huge. Um, backcountry etiquette. And then kind of like the most basic skills to me for ski mountaineering are being able to use crampons and an ice axe and knowing, you know, French stepping and uh, duck footing. If you want to read Freedom of the Hills, they'll get all the OG French terms for how to cramp on. I can't, I can't rifle them off. You got them, Trevor? Pourquoi pas alors? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, you know, with, with your basic touring skills, a good level of fitness and cramp on and ice axe skills, like you can access a lot of really, really cool terrain. Awesome. Yeah. And then, you know, on top of those basic skills, there's obviously a lot of things that we want to look to, to learn, right? So, um, you know, Trevor, feel free to go through some of these, you know, added skills maybe that we should cover. And Will, feel free to jump in here too. Yeah, kind of going off of what uh, Will was talking about, I, I totally agree. It's like uh, we see a lot of people kind of coming into uh, 
ski mountaineering and, and it's just like they're not really prepared to be to be out there right and I think if, especially that that being said if you're going to go out um, and do this with people it needs to be good mentors that are are practicing good skills and um, I think something that you know if you're coming from the rock climbing world it's like learning to be comfortable and climbing in mixed terrain right you might um, you might be on ice a little bit you might be on rock and like being comfortable like traveling with your your crampons on um, also like understanding rope work and like how to select a good rope, um, understanding like, you know, if you're climbing in glaciated terrain, like how to travel through like zones with crevasses, right. How to repel into certain zones, you know, um, camping is huge too. If you're going to do multi-day trips, like kind of understanding like certain little tips and tricks, like how to keep your, your skins, like, you know, how to dry your skins at the end of the day. Right. Um, also, like that being said, if you're going to be messing with ropes, like understanding how to how to do knots, um, snow anchors are always super beneficial. If you ever get in a spot where you might need them, perhaps like in a rescue situation, or if you feel like um, someone feels uncomfortable and you have to kind of like use that to help lower someone down. Um, and uh, you know, like crevasse rescue training is so crucial if you're going to be going on crevasses. Like I, I can't tell you how many times I see people traveling on crevasses, whether it be Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Baker, the north side of Shasta, and like, they just, they're, they're not practicing the right um, techniques. And it's like, if somebody falls into crevasse, you know, like, and they bring you down with them, it's not going to be a good day. So um, I think like making sure that you're well versed in this stuff before you kind of jump into it, whether that means going out with a professional guide, or once again, training with people that can teach you that are good mentors, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Will, anything to add there? No, I think that's that's it, you know. Um, I think, again, just talking about terrain progression, you know, like you don't need all these skills to be a split or ski mountaineer, right? And so always just trying to build your skills in less consequential terrain and then stepping up your terrain as your skills are prepared for it. Absolutely. Well, awesome, you know, and on top of that, like Trevor was mentioning, you know, it's, that, that's a lot of skills that he just went through. You know, it's tough if you don't have a great mentor. Lucky, luckily for us, there's a lot of great guiding companies that offer things just like this, you know. So, um, you know, I'll let you guys kind of discuss the different education um, that we really recommend. Trevor, what is the best course you've ever taken? The best course I've ever taken? I yeah. mean, probably, I'd say either my woofer or the uh, avalanche course, like my level one, probably. You're like rec level one. Yeah. Like way back in the day. Cause yeah. I had no clue what I was doing when I first jumped into it. And it was like, you know, I think I went into the back country maybe a couple of times and it was like, I had enough sense to realize like, Oh, like it's important for me to understand what's going on. Take it yeah. out of course. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. I think like uh, just in my own career, like mentorship has been really hard to come by. It's always been more of like a, uh, a friendship, mutual learning type scenario, or, or honestly, like me on YouTube or reading guidebooks or whatever on like building these like um, tangible skills. And I think, um, man, I forgot where I was going with that. But just learn, like getting a group of friends to learn with and finding people who are curious about the same things is a, like one of the best tools you can use to progress your skills, right? Like right. Through, the, through the AMGA program, like you find guides who are also doing the same thing. So you have like this kind of uh, aligned focus where you can learn and, and meet these objectives together. But I think just having friends who are psyched on skiing similar stuff, you can be like, hey, let's go practice uh, some crevasse rescue training so we can go to Rainier this spring, right? And like have someone who's down to nerd out with you. Same thing for a beacon practice too, right? Like you want partners who are down to practice with you. Yep. And I would even say, you know, it's maybe where you were going with that is it's, you know, in the past decade, a lot of guide ops have started actually offering ski mountaineering courses. You know, for instance, Golden State Guiding offers spring touring camps. Um, and you can always request a guide that's knowledgeable of those specific skills, right? So maybe you don't need to book a specific mountaineering course, 
But if you contact a local guide service and say, hey, do you got, you know, guides that are proficient in rock climbing, which most are, you know, especially year round guides, um, you can learn a lot of these skills in an unofficial course, right? Maybe you just book a guided day and go out and learn these skills and gain a new mentor, you know, all for less than the cost of an average day pass at a lot of resorts, right? Especially here in Colorado. So yeah. uh, Trevor, anything to add on education, bud? Yeah, for sure. And I think kind of like talking about Will and, um, you know, what Will just said is like a lot of these avalanche courses, you know, uh, both Will and I teach avalanche courses. And so many times we get all these people that are able to to meet people that are at their level when they come out of that course. And I know here up in, in Lake Tahoe, we have like a group that we run um, and it allows people to connect with other people, you know. Um, but I, I think that, you know, that being said, it's also really important to like have some sort of first aid in the backcountry, especially if you're going to be doing longer missions, you know, um, for years, I would go out with like my friend group, and I was like the, the guide in the group that had the medical knowledge. And, you know, there was a couple of instances where there was a lot of pressure on me, because out of those 10 people, I was the only person with medical knowledge. And um, so it can be kind of kind of be crazy, you know, um, in that sense to um, deal with that stuff. So I, I highly recommend if you have the opportunity to do like some sort of first aid course, it can come in so clutch and could end up, you know, like saving someone's life. You never know. I mean, I've come across crazy situations on Rainier where you walk up to someone and, and they're just like out of it and they're just laying there by themselves, you know? So having some medical knowledge, I think um, is super clutch. Yep. I would second that about the woofer course. Taking that was one of the, took that early in my guiding career and it was eye-opening all the different things that can happen and how they might be different than just simply calling 911 and waiting on an ambulance and gave me a lot more confidence in the backcountry, I would say, um, especially when you're talking ski mountaineering and strapping sharp things to you. Um, definitely something that, that you want to have knowledge of, right? Yeah. Awesome. I see a question here in the chat yep. uh, from Antonio and Laura about resources for inexpensive guides. Um, so I kind of want to dig a little deeper into that question and like you can almost break uh an objective into like a like component and process pieces for how to get there right so like let's say your goal is climbing mount rainier um in order to do that like all right so climb mount rainier and then ski your board off the top right like that's what we're trying to do in order to do that you have to be a good rider right you have to have overnight camping skills you have to know how to use the crampon and ice axe um you have to know how to travel in a rope team on a glacier and you have to know uh crevasse rescue i would say those are like your basic pieces of how to climb mount rainier and then fitness you got to be fit to do it and so if you look at those component pieces examine those and figure what you're comfortable learning on your own and teaching yourself and what you think you need help with right and then so like out of that group, I'd be like, I can go to the resort and ski by myself. I can go to a frozen hill and practice crampons after watching some YouTube videos for a few hours, right? Learn the different techniques. Um, I could practice uh, winter camping in my backyard. What makes me comfortable? What works? What doesn't work? Um, I could practice the crevasse rescue skills in my backyard. The only thing I can't do in my backyard is travel on a glacier because I don't have any here. Right. And so if you can tune up all those other skills on your own and then show up with a guide and be like, hey, I've taught myself all this stuff. Can you tell me what I'm doing wrong and point me in the right direction for how to travel on this glacier? Like you'll get a hugely rewarding experience out of that than versus just showing up and be like, hey, teach me everything. So yeah. And I think like adding to that too for Antonio and Laura is um you know, like taking these courses, if you do like a six or like a nine day course, you know, it, it, it is pretty expensive, but what you come out of that course, um, you'll have all those skills and all the basics that, that you could need to, to get up a glacier, you know? So I, I kind of, the way I look at it, it's like a lifetime of, of um, you know, a lifetime of education, right? You get those skills, you meet people in the course that are taking those skills too. And I met a lot of people that come out and I, I do nine day courses with them and they, they meet other people in the course. And the next year I hear they're off in like Argentina or something, climbing something, you know? So I think like 
you know, it's, it is um, a hefty price potentially for some uh, at the get go, but once you get those skills, it's like something you could take with you for a long time. So um, I hear where you're coming from. I mean, we're, we're all dirt bag guides too. So it's like, we all started out somewhere and, and getting that knowledge and, and finding the best price is, is good for sure. But um, I'd say definitely trying to find good quality is something that can be hard to find these days. So making sure you choose um, the right operation and the right guides for sure. Fantastic advice, gentlemen. So, you know, next up fitness. I think this is, you know, should be fairly obvious if you're, you know, getting into mountaineering and you're literally trying to climb mountains. Um, that fitness should be important, but here's just kind of some specifics here. Uh, Trevor, will feel free to jump into some specifics here on kind of what you guys do to stay fit. Uh, maybe discuss a little bit about your, you know, year round activities, or do you just lay on the couch all summer, take naps? I know Trevor does, but he, yeah. he, crush, he crushes me off the couch anyway, so it's all good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing is like, it's such a endurance sport where like you don't need to be fast, but you need to be able to go all day and multiple days in a row. And so for me, that's just like staying active year round. Um, like in the summertime, I mountain bike and I hike and I climb and just, I do it for the enjoyment of movement. Right. And I don't know, what's your, what's your off season training? Like do you stay? Yeah. I mean, I think road biking, uh, mountain biking for sure. Um, I, I feel like Personally, like one of the best ways to get really good shape, especially like coming into the springtime for like, um, you know, spring mountaineering and, and um, ski and splitboard mountaineering is, is trail running. If you have like the opportunities to trail run, it's like such a good thing, especially if you do it at elevation too. Um, you know, obviously to ski touring in the wintertime or, or splitboard touring is, is great. But it, like when I get out and I start running, I feel so much better when I come up and start doing big mountains and stuff. Um, I will say all, all the people I ski with who are faster than me, which is most of them are all trail runners. Yeah. That's like the sure. common, that's like the common thread between getting smoked on the skin track or not is yeah. them being a trail runner. Yeah. Um, and I think like, even like doing, like I do a lot of breathing exercises too. And that comes in so clutch um, for big mountains. And I think like, you know, at the bottom there, it says rest and recovery, like, you know, making sure you're stretching and, and uh, you know, yoga, stretching, foam rolling, all that stuff, super important. But like, if you're going up in a high elevation, I think breathing exercises can be super beneficial. And, and, you know, like I, I know that I see swimming on there too. And swimming, I think is really awesome too for your body. Cause it, it doesn't take as much, you know, pressure on the joints and whatnot. Um, but uh, you know, Another thing to like look into is like the uphill athlete and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, Steve House does a lot of crazy stuff with training and, and making sure that you're just like ready to go do this stuff. So that way you're not like, you know, painfully, like just every step is like, oh, agonizing. And I see that all the time. It's like, oh, what did you do to train for this climb? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, I've been working and I walk around a lot at work. And it's like, you know do it for yourself so that you are mentally there um mentally and physically right because mental the mental game plays so much of a role in this you know so uh um, yeah to, to add to that trevor like i've always i've always looked at fitness in the mountains through a lens of like respect for the mountains right like when i go into these amazing places i want to show up the best version of myself so I can do the best things that I think I'm capable of doing. Because at the end of the day, like, yeah, you get to cool places, but like what drives us to like, climb these mountains and do these things, it's like this like test for ourselves to like know if we can do it, to stand on top of that mountain. And like to show up on day one and having not prepared for it is showing up without respect for the place you're going, right? So like put in the time and respect your body, respect the place you're going and be fit but really it's like it doesn't really matter what you do just move and you know we're humans and we have a body so freaking love it you know for sure and i think like that being said there is something to be said about like getting that base you know that base core down and like a lot of that just comes from walking you know, like you can go walk around and like you know it's like sometimes i feel like i get the best from that like especially when i'm out moving slower you know so um just something to keep in mind yeah, you can go like full nerd on all this stuff or you go like full hippie on all this stuff, but whatever it is, doesn't really matter. Like 
just enjoy it, right? Love it. Well put, gentlemen. Well put. Well, all right. Now we'll kind of get into some gear, um, which I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions on. We won't cover kind of basic gear like we've covered in our previous episodes. If anyone has questions on basic splitboard gear, uh, binding skins, poles, you know, all, all the, the basic stuff, feel free to just watch that episode of Get the Gear. Uh, that's on YouTube. That's on our, our website as well. Uh, also, you know, our packing list here. Um, Ellen will drop a link to this in the chat. Uh, if you want, you know, a sweet little backcountry packing list to throw up on the, on your, you know, just keep it on your phone even, uh, throw it up on the fridge, do whatever you want with it. But this is just kind of the, the basics here. Nice little checklist here for you. So um, Trevor, I'll kind of let you get into how, how terrain and, and gear planning um, might change for a splitter ski mountaineering uh, trip. Yeah, for sure. So I think like understanding what sort of terrain you're getting into definitely um, can change like with our mindset and our gear selection, right? Uh, a lot of times going out into the, you know, when I'm out splitboard mountaineering, especially on like the, in the Eastern Sierra and stuff, I'm typically just bringing like my standard kit, like ice axe, crampons, maybe a harness and maybe a lightweight rope. But a lot of times, like if you're booting up a cool bar, you don't really need a lot of that stuff, right? Um, I always have some sort of a rescue kit. So I always have a little bit of like a rattle line or a rope in my kit just in case. But um, a lot of times, like most of the not like non-technical stuff that I'm doing are, are some of the most exciting things um, that I've ever done personally, like not even needing a rope. It's just like knowing how to use my ice axe and my um, crampons and, and there you have it. Uh, then you kind of start getting into glaciated terrain, right? Um, so you're going to just kind of start to carry a different kit. You'll have a rope, you'll have a glacier travel kit, um, and you'll, you'll have, uh, you know, obviously helmet for all this stuff as well, which we'll talk about a little later. And then you kind of can get into more technical stuff when we're looking at like potentially like ice climbing. So you're use burning ice screws, um, gear to clip in. Um, you still got your glacier travel kit. Um, and then anchoring equipment and whatnot too. We're talking like cordelette, we're talking like runners, um, all that sort of stuff, um, micro traction, which, you know, to find a good, there's a lot of good links to good glacier travel kits, but typically, you know, on my glacier travel kit, I'm always having, um, you know, like a micro traction in a, in a tie block or a T block. Um, anything else to add on that, Will? Yeah, I mean, like for a glacier travel kit, is that what you're asking? Or just in general, like for train and gear planning, you know, yeah. in the mountaineering realm. Yeah. Um, well, to add to the glacier kit, like I think Petzl's rad system, their rad line system is like top notch, right? They give you all the pieces that you need to extricate your buddy. I think minus like a ice screw and minus whatever snow anchor you're going to use. But uh, if you guys look at that kit, it, um, it'll kind of give you all the component pieces and continuing on the glacier thing like if you read freedom of the hills you're going to get outdated info on what kind of glacier travel kit you should get um i would argue that like the petzl radline system is minimum requirements for glacier travel just because it's so much more efficient it takes so much of the guesswork out of like oh i need to like put three pressings on here and one for baseline. And then you're like, it's like really intense rope knowledge that you need to work through those issues, which I think are great. But I think as a standard, that Petzl rad kit is awesome. Um, and then, yeah, for gear planning, like I actually have a few different checklists in my phone that have like all the pieces I need depending on what I'm looking at. And like, because there's a ton of gear and it sucks when you forget something. And so checklists are really good at helping you remember everything. Yeah. And I mean, the, this comes in also be, with being more advanced, right? Like if you end up in a, a pretty hairy zone and you don't have the right pieces, you know, if you're doing like a mixed climb, all of a sudden you're having to run out something, it can be kind of scary. So um, yeah, kind of like you're saying, Will, just like making sure you're dialed with that kit. And like the biggest way, like, to start out is kind of like just the way that this list is lined up, right? Start on the left and then kind of over years and years move over to the right. I mean, I still haven't done a lot of ice climbing uh, specifically to reach my objective for splitboard mountaineering. I've actually never done that, right? Um, 
And so just kind of thinking about what you need. And a lot of that comes with getting out in the field more and doing this more, right? I, I definitely would highly recommend that you don't just step out onto a glacier and, and, and kind of jump into that world. I mean, I'd say start with like that steep non-technical terrain and kind of move on up from there. Um, Cause it, it does take a lot of time to kind of get comfortable with this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would second that the steep and technical stuff. Like, I've done a little bit of like scrambling, you know, like low fifth class to get up something, but in terms of like extended pitches of climbing or ice climbing, I have not done that myself. Um, rappelling is a different story that you could kind of loop into that. Like you, I would argue that rappelling into a line is a technical approach. Um, but yeah, all sure. fun stuff. Perfect. Cool. What do we got uh, here, boys? That's a picture of me on the Roman head wall on Mount Baker, um, an epic split or ski mountaineering objective. I actually had like the best run of my life this day where we, it probably snowed like a foot two days before uh, up in the Mount Baker zone. Everything consolidated over two days. The Roman head wall was kind of stripped like you can see here, but um, once you got down to that saddle, we dropped into the right and we had like 6,000 feet of boot top pow on a glacier and it was purely epic. It was so good. Um, so just wanted to put that little anecdote in here. So, so a good reason to develop these skills as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, this is amazing. Mount Baker is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, haven't ever had this view of it though. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we'll kind of quickly dive into some of the basic gear, you know, um, before we get into some of these specific things that the guys have been talking about, um, just so they can go into a little more depth on, on what those things were they were mentioning. Um, but you know, when, when people are getting into split boarding, one of the, the most common questions I get asked is, do I need split boarding boots? You know, I say, no, you're getting bindings and skins and a board and poles and Abbey education and a pack and, you know, all of these things are super expensive, wear the, the boots that you have till they're worn out, and then look at maybe getting some split boarding boots where if you're getting into mountaineering, uh, you know, maybe, maybe my answer would change. You know, maybe you do want to look for more of a split boarding or mountaineering specific boot with maybe a, a more of a heavy duty sole, uh, you know, a nice rubber toe, um, specifically a boot designed to take crampons, right? Um, something that's just going to give you a little bit more protection when you're out for, you know, 10, 12 hour days or multi-day trips in the mountains. So um, a lot of great split boarding boots out there. I run a K2 Aspect just because they're really comfortable. Um, I've worn a lot of other kinds of boots um, from, you know, those fit wells that are on here that are super, super beefy. Um, and if I am in a, a soft boot, you know, like we call them, I would probably just find one that fits your feet really well um, and has the capabilities that you're looking for. Um, I think that's the most important thing is that it's comfortable because you're going to be in it for long periods of time. Um, anything you guys want to add on split boarding soft boots? Trevor, you got something? They're both hard booters, so I <laughs> quiet here. <laughs> no, I would I just would... say that there is a there is a lot more um, there's more technology coming out and more boots that are designed specifically for split board mountaineering. So I would just like look into that a little bit more. Uh, boots that kind of do the dual the dual thing, uh, which is they're they're out there for sure. And so it kind of just comes with with getting used to and kind of trying out or demoing certain boots to see if they would be a good fit. Um, for mountaineering as well. Absolutely. Um, and here's the good stuff, split boarding hard boots. Um, you know, so I, I ride a phantom setup. Um, I ran atomic backlands for a few years before that. I know Will and Trevor both run hard boot setups as well. Um, what do you guys think the benefits are of a hard boot setup? Why, why would someone maybe look to move to hard boots? Do you say, uh, yeah, go for it, Will. Um, How do you spell that? H-O-L-W-I-C-K. Um, sorry, got distracted there. Um, why are we hard boots? Uh, I got you down for March 24th. I think they're the greatest. Um, I got February 24th, 25th, and 26th. 
Where are you guys? Sorry, we got some interference here. Yeah. Ellen, we mute that guy. Let's see, do you know who you book, uh, who you book through? My wife's booking for I me. Mean, she's in New York with my daughter. My son, I just drove for six hours to get here. Is that uh, Ryan there? Or, oh, there he goes. We're off. The, I think that was okay. Ryan. So, um, hard boots. Well, so I'll kind of start with the backstory. I, I rode soft boots for a long time and then I was going through like two boots a season. And when you like start buying a split board specific soft boot, they're like 400 or 500 bucks. And so that's like, you know, a thousand bucks a season in boots that I would throw out and come back next year and be like, shit, it's already got a hole in it and I got to get another boot. So I was like, all right. In addition to that, uh, I was working on Mount Shasta and when I did split board mountaineering courses up there, I'd be in my soft boot with fully like strap on crampons onto my boot. And you would have some like fully terrifying moments where you're on like really firm snow or ice and you step and your boot is like shifting around on those, on those spikes. And, uh, yeah, so continuing on with those problems, I come to find out that people are riding hard boots on their snowboard. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I'm like, you can put a crampon on there, a fully automatic crampon that's super secure. Uh, you're, it's super efficient to tour. They weigh about half as much if you subtract out the binding and the double leather boot. And I'm like, this seems like a no brainer to me. Um, and I rode uh, Solomon X Alps first, and they were like really, really stiff. And then Phantom came out with these boots that you're looking at here, and I got those, and I'm like totally sold. I think they're great. Um, they're flexible. They, any pain point I've heard snowboarders talk about, like it pretty much addresses it. Um, and also, I feel like it's like driving a freaking go kart. They're super responsive, totally like. Feel the toe, you're ripping on them. So I'm a convert. Yeah. You couldn't tell. <laughs> sure. Uh, I think like for me, like a big part of it is also like when you think about how much time you spend in your boots and like in uphill mode when you're touring, it's like, it's so much, um, in my opinion, you know, you can get so much more traction and whatnot with that. Um, as well as like, you can ski your split board, like skis if you need to. Right. I mean, even yesterday I was having some problems with my bindings and I just threw them into downhill ski mode and skied out, you know? And so I, I do feel like there's versatility there. Um, I just, just replaced my TLT sixes, um, gosh, like a few days ago. And I had those for over six years, I guess, like into the backcountry. So that, I mean, the only thing I really changed was the liners. And um, I ride Phantom bindings, but I don't ride the Phantom slipper. I, I've converted the TLT Dinafit program, um, and I, I find that works for me. And it's it's half the price point um, of Phantom slippers, uh, but you can also do that with like the Atomic Backland, Backlands and, and whatnot. So there are ways to find a, a cheaper hard boot setup, but um, at the end of the day, it's it's I feel like it's just so clutch, especially when you're you're touring up like maybe a lot of variable snow surfaces. Hundred percent. Right. I second all those things. <laughs> I was the first year I tried them. I was like, nope, never going back. Got rid yeah. of my soft boot setup. Just yeah. you know, going across a you know no fall zone. You know, across you know an icy face. Um, just you. I, I remember just feeling like a, a mountain goat. <laughs> just being like, I could stand here all day. This is fantastic. I, yeah. I feel so much safer, um, you know, and just more, I don't know, just way, way safer, way, way more just dialed in the backcountry on those boots. And my, you know, the same thought process as Trevor, it's like, I'm split boarding 97% of my day I'm walking, <laughs> you know, yeah. so why not buy a boot made for walking, right? These boots are made for walking and they split board pretty good. <laughs> so totally. that, uh, that's what I do. And, you know, it just took me a while to get them um, dialed in, fitted, you know, and, and, you know, pro tip, get it, get a two, three year old atomic backland, you know, from a demo center for two, 300 bucks. You can save, you know, a ton of money there and just put a link lever on it, move some straps. Um, there's all kinds of blogs about that stuff. So for sure. But yeah, I, I agree that, with all that. Being that we're split borders also like, 
you don't understand potentially the idea of going to a, a ski shop and having them like mold your 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 boots as well too so like making sure that you know if you need to do any changes taking it to like a boot fitter that can help you um, get those comfy because i know for me with my ski my ski downhill ski setup for the backcountry it took me definitely like three or four visits until i i started feeling better about it so just something yep. to keep in mind. my first pair took me three or four visits my last pair i wouldn't leave the shop until they were dialed and they almost kicked <laughs> me out after like four hours nice. yes yeah. they kept going go ski it and i was like no these aren't that's not what these are they're walking shoes <laughs> you know i'll just walk around and then you know the same thing with at or ski touring boots right you know you can there, there's a lot of kind of crossover boots obviously mainly the boots you're looking for have a walk function but you can kind of go with boots that really ski a lot more like um you know a a typical alpine boot or you can really go to a super techie ski boot that walks amazing and skis pretty well so trevor you're the only skier on this call so <laughs> feel free to, to jump in here about any tips here while will and i enjoy yeah, no, I mean, I think it's kind of similar to what we were just talking about, um, you know, making sure you have that toe box on the end is clutch. I know that I have the Hojis, like the Dinafit Hojis, and like, I didn't even think about when I got them, they don't really have like a toe box that extends. So I have to have like the flexible toe bail with my crampons. Um, but I mean, there's a ton of good boots out there. I mean, definitely lighter weight, but I still kind of want a heavier duty boot when I'm in the backcountry um, ski touring. So um, that it just kind of comes down to like finding a boot that fits well for you. I think like every single boot manufacturer, it fits differently, right? There's some that are, are wider and, and I have a pretty narrow foot. So I find for myself, like the Dina fits work pretty well and I've got some Technicas as well. Um, but uh, yeah, just kind of like testing it out. And most, most backcountry boots are pretty reliable um, for the most part. And they're, they're extremely durable and versatile and you'll have them you know, for definitely for at least a few seasons, unless you're like really retching on them. Right. Yeah. I expected to have my back lands forever and then just got a good, good deal on some phantoms. I was but like, uh, oh. one thing that to note here is if you do do the dual thing like me, definitely don't take your split boarding hard boots and try to ski on them. Cause I, I tried that my very first year <laughs> guiding and like, I still have problems with my Achilles. It's just, they're too soft. Right. Um, usually with my my AT setup, I have like a 110, 120 flex. And so definitely not the same case with my my split board uh, boots. So just something to keep in mind. Good tip. All right. And then bindings, you know, we won't go too much further into hard boot bindings and boots, but, um, you know, Phantom makes a great hard boot binding. Um, there's a, And there's actually more on the market now. You know, Spark makes a great one. The Dino, I think Garrett Corum just came out with a hard boot binding. So there are a lot more options, um, you know, because the, these phantom bindings sell out pretty darn quick. But I, I like them just because it saves me a lot of weight. It kind of adds um, some distance for me um, just because I don't have the bindings on the board anymore. And then when I'm riding, it actually locks in the board really, really well. Um, just from my personal experience, the phantoms really stiffen up the board um, and kind of don't allow the, the, the two skis of the split board to separate at all, which is nice in my opinion. I like a really responsive stiff board. Um, and the spark system does allow a little bit of flex. So it's a kind of a personal preference. Um, anything else you guys want to add on hard boot binding specifically? I think um, just kind of like tying all this gear talk back to uh, like efficiency when you're ski mountaineering and um, like, if we, if we jump back to that basic skills, like being super dialed on your transitions, I think is like a top priority that people don't put much attention to. Like if, I don't know if I have any of my old clients on this thing, but whenever I have new folks on like a backcountry 101, I'm always like, you know, that scene in Forrest Gump when he's field dressing his rifle, he's doing it blindfolded and he's like the fastest kid in the room. Like that's what you want to be on your split board. You want to be so dialed that the skiers are waiting on you. And so if you take that, if you take that efficiency concept and then start like looking at all the pieces of your gear and like, is that the most efficient it could be? Like you end up in this place where hard boots and hard boot bindings are definitely the most efficient uh, setup and rig for a split board. Um, and so like when you're doing these huge ski mountaineering missions, 
all those little efficiencies are going to compound throughout the day to like make an objective happen. Um, and alternatively, if you're super inefficient, like you could lose your objective in the day because you run out of time or the window slips by or whatever. So um, yeah, just looking at where you can cut seconds off your race time, right? Sweet. Trevor, I'll let you dive into the ski bindings. So yeah, it's talking about ski bindings. Definitely, um, we've seen a lot of people like in, in these courses come out with bindings that do the, the dual trick, right? You see a lot of like those shifts, right? Um, the shift bindings and whatnot, they can, they can serve as a resort ski and um, a backcountry to like ski binding. Um, I think like it's really good to kind of keep it tech ski bindings, especially if you're doing ski mountaineering stuff. Like it's just so much more reliable in the backcountry and it's a lighter setup as well. Um, and I think like just making sure that you have a specific, you know, ski that's um, and binding specifically for the backcountry and one that's specifically for the resort. I think trying to pair the two can be a little bit of a challenge. And a lot of people run into that. Um, was that a day? Was that a day on uh, Solomon uh, shifts there, brother? No, I, I didn't say anything about shifts. Uh, I think like it's all I'm saying is just probably keep it techie. Yeah. Uh, just because I, I do run into a lot of those problems with those bindings in the backcountry. And unless you know how to fix those quirks, you might be running into some trouble. Um, but also, you're probably not going to be skiing. You know, if you're going to ski mountaineering, you're probably going to have a totally different ski um, as well. So I think just keeping it light. Uh, is good. And I think those tech toes are, are definitely the way to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, just like opting for a lighter setup when you're doing ski mountaineering will be super beneficial. Miles, I see your question there on uh, release risks with Alpine versus Touring bindings. Uh, both bindings are going to have a DIN setting on there, which is like their release setting. And uh, if you never set your DINs before, there's like a whole chart that you got to run through and you get your um, recommended DIN setting. And in order to manufacture ski bindings, they have to have some sort of DIN setting. Um, if you're like sending it off of cliffs, you're gonna want an Alpine binding where you can actually crank the DINs up higher than what's normally recommended. Um, and there's like kind of some boutique touring bindings where you can crank the DINs up pretty high, but um, for the most part, it's going to have a normal release, normal DIN setting on there, like any other binding. Yeah, and I see Justin's comment there too, like the cast bindings. I think if you're going to do something that could do both, are are definitely the best option of of all the options, in my opinion. Sweet. What are the cast bindings? I'm not familiar with those. Uh, they got like the tech toe piece, but then when you come downhill, you've got the rest of your toe piece on, like. And you put that on top of the tech token. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a little burlier. Yeah, yeah, and so you yeah. can ride the resort with it. Yeah, yeah. That's from what I've seen, that seems to be the best setup that you can do both with. Both. Nice. Well, sweet. You guys, uh, uh, this picture is just a little blurry. You guys want to get into helmets here and keep in mind, we don't have an hour on helmets. These guys could do a, a lot, long time on helmets, but we'll let, who wants, who wants to take over the helmet discussion here? I think Will's the, the like judging by President what you were talking about expert. yesterday, you're the man on that. Um, yeah. So, you know, I want to start with the helmets or cool sticker. Um, sorry, my, I think my internet's lagging here. Ben, can you, can you go to the next slide? Can you go to the next slide there? Anyways, I can start talking. Um, so yeah, helmets, I wear them. I figure my brain does all my work for me. I want to protect my noggin. Um, every season we have a uh, local doctor come kind of tune us up for the season on like common winter injuries. And every year he comes with like, new stories of people who died from traumatic brain injuries like at ski resorts and his thing is always like you know a helmet could have saved that injury so i'm a big helmet guy um when it gets into ski mountaineering like 
there's obviously like all these niche products, right? And like at the end of the day, if you have a helmet, that's what matters. But if you're like trying to nerd out and like lose grams on your kit, um, there's like different ratings you can get on these helmets. And uh, what you want to look for is like a ski and or a ski mountaineering specific helmet, like that uh, Petzl helmet on the right is super light. It's rated for ski touring. Um, and it'll do the trick. I wear the helmet at the bottom here, the Solomon. And then I think Ben was saying he likes the BCA up top, but really it's like, you want something light. I like a helmet where you can either take out um, insulation or put it in. And especially like here in the Sierra on the east side on spring days, it gets super hot. And like, you don't want a beanie on basically under your helmet. So finding a helmet where you can strip that stuff out and put multiple uses into it. Perfect. Yeah. Trevor, what kind of uh, helmet are you running? Uh, I've got the Solomon uh, helmet, um, which I use for pretty much backcountry touring and when I'm up on mountains. Um, I, I Sometimes I will use like my climbing helmet, um, which is the Petzl one. I use that sometimes too when I'm doing like big mountain stuff like on on shasta and whatnot um but yeah i find the solomon one to be pretty pretty good and like could take the ear flaps out as well um i, I did notice the avoid the audio thing and i did see that comment from matt matt scott there i was wondering what was going on there i don't know if we just threw that in there uh in the slide here we're talking about like those gimmicky uh helmets that like have like the speakers that you can plug in and listen to oh, yeah. you're shredding but um, to communicate with my team, I use a like a BCA type radio. Oh, for sure. That's yeah, ex definitely. exterior to the helmet. I've and then seen, you just got your Bluetooth speaker that you hand off the back and then make everybody yeah. listen, listen to, to like Limp Biscuit and Kid Rock, you know? Yeah. yeah. Cool. You've got one of each strapped to the tips of his split skis. For sure. Yes. Yes. all right ski crampons you know i get a lot of questions on these um this is you know one of the first pieces i recommend people pick up even if they're not specifically getting into um ski mountaineering these things are super handy on you know icy spring mornings when a skin track is super icy um through you know crossing across you know maybe above no fall zones super handy pretty much every binding company is going to make these um, but yeah, just super handy to have. I'll keep them, you know, in my pack or, or on me most, most trips I'm going out, especially early morning starts. Um, any, anything to add on ski crampons here? I mean, it's something I always have in my pack in the springtime. And I mean, even here in Tahoe, going through that crazy dry spell, it was something that was super clutch. I mean, you don't want to end up in like a slide for life situation, um, and I, I think ski crampons are something like, like I said, I'll, I'll usually just throw them in my pack. They're so lightweight, especially, you know, it, it, they can become super useful for sure. Right. Yeah. The I, use cases for them are unique, but like when you're in that use case, like you don't want anything else. Yep. I've, uh, have you guys ever tried skeets? No. What is that? They're, they're almost like a volet strap with some spiked brass knuckles strapped to them. Oh, okay. You strap around in front of your toe. So yeah. you're not carrying this big um, ski crampon. It's like a smaller, lighter version. I like those for, you know, smaller things. Um, they're a little company based in Jackson. Uh, I've been running those. I basically, those nice. are always in my pack. And sometimes I'll throw in the actual ski crampons if I'm like getting out, uh, getting after something a little bit bigger where I know like I'm going to be in sketchy areas where the, the skeets are just kind of something easy to have in my pack. They don't weigh anything. They're great. Um, yeah, I'll so check yeah. Those out. yeah, they're pretty neat. You guys might dig them. Um, boot crampons. I'll let you guys just dive right into boot crampons and what they're used for. Uh, sorry, real quick, Ben. Uh, yeah. For Corey, yes, those ski crampons that you saw on the top right of that last slide are for split, are for yeah. a split board. You just want to make sure if you're buying them, like you, they're specific to the binding that you have. Yep. Yeah, I just wrote that. I was just writing them back uh, when we were switching slides. So, cool. yeah. Perfect. And then, yeah, boot crampons. Uh, I'll, I'll let you guys dive into it. But one of the most common questions I get asked for split borders with soft boots, what crampon do we recommend? 
Um, I ran a Gravel G10 wide. It fit my K2 aspect really well. Um, you know, and you can get them, I think in a steel or an aluminum, um, I'm pretty sure. Um, but that one fit my boot really well. I recommend you take your boots into a, um, backcountry ski shop and test fit crampons before you buy them. Yeah. Uh, to add to that, Ben, if you have soft boots and you're buying crampons, I recommend doing a full strap on type crampon, not a semi-auto because yep. there's, a, there's a lot of like soft boots that say that they're crampon compatible, but when you actually use the semi-auto, it's, it's sketchy. So if you have a soft yeah. boot, do a full strap. If you have a hard boot, do a full auto. Yeah. It's like a soft rubber toe. <laughs> in there, yeah, like, we, yeah. Yeah. We call I, that I soft. This Gravel G10 full, full strap. Yeah. Yeah. So like a soft toe bail. Yeah. Yep. Trevor, how many crampons do you have? <laughs> I, I only have one pair actually. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's I, I use my steel. I use my steel ones um, pretty much for everything. I mean, they're All so around. versatile. I'll definitely get some more lightweight ones now. Uh, but uh, yeah, the ones that I use seem to do the, the trick and I've been using them for years. And uh, so I think like just making, you know, that's like the difference between using a durable setup that steel is, is heavier, but it'll get the job done in ice and whatnot um, versus aluminum, which is a little bit less durable and versatile, I guess. Yeah. Um, so just something to kind of think about with that. I use uh, hybrid crampons that are super lightweight. They're like marketed for uh, ski mountaineering, but they have like uh, the front toes are steel and the rear toes are aluminum. And then they're connected with like a Dyneema cable and they're super lightweight. Um, and you can like front point and ice with them if you need to. Um, they're sweet for split and ski mountaineering. What brand are those? Uh, I think Petzl makes those. Yep. Petzl's coming in strong in this presentation. I'm seeing it. <laughs> I mean, I they, think Black Diamond makes some like great crampons too. Petzl and Black Diamond and Gravel, I'd say. Um, I think yeah. Camp does some cool stuff in regards to like the soft boot setup. Um, they used to be kind of like the Primo with that um as well but uh yeah petzl is coming coming in right. um, also black diamond full auto on my uh phantoms yeah. um any storage tips other than don't put them in with your puff jacket yeah i mean i think like kind of like the uh toe to tail way to do them facing towards each other and then kind of wrapping them around and if you have gators or something just kind of wrapping them with gators around that is usually the way that i do it yeah perfect uh, yeah. I think we got some questions we might need to catch up on here too. Um, Fire away. We can also exactly. save them to the end um, if you guys want. Okay, so whatever's easier. whatever's easiest. Let's what see. What do you think, Will? I'm gonna answer the uh, semi-auto Gravel do it. and K2 mountaineering boots. Yes, I do not like the semi-auto together because I found you can actually see in that picture in the top right there are semi-auto crampons on that boot. But I found like the the heel welt on the back of the boot was like on a mountaineering boot, it's it's hard plastic back there that you're actually like clipping your crampon onto. And these are like molded into the rubber. And so yeah. even though you get like a click, it'll flex and move and be insecure on there. So those like terrifying moments I was talking about a while ago um, with the crampon shifting were on those semi-auto um, crampons um james johnston let's save your question for the end and we'll save zach's question for the end on switching and tyvek sacks yeah it's a huge tip you can get like the little tyvek sacks from the post office and put your sharp stuff in there that'll help protect it um Ooh, i like that yeah sweet yeah all cool. right so Sorry. Postage paid for. Right. I said full send, postage paid for. <laughs> all right. The, the question nice. we've all been waiting for what in the hell is an ice axe versus an ice tool or a mountaineering tool? What is what are these things all about? <laughs> um, so our ice axe is going to be for like traditional mountaineering where we're walking up a hill, um, not swinging it using it for self-belay and self-arrest. 
an ice tool is meant to be swung into ice and pulled down on to go up is the simplest. Perfect. And so what are we looking at right here on this slide? Those are both ice axes. Yep. Yeah. Even though this one on the right kind of looks like an ice tool, it has some similar features, right? Like a little finger. So there, this, maybe. Again, this is Petzl crushing the game. Yep. That's, that's their uh, like ski mountaineering ice axe. They put a hammer on the end so you can hammer some pitons for your extreme repels. And then they recurve the pick. So if you need to like get over a ice step, you can swing it. And they put that sliding pommel on there, which is pretty sweet too. Yep. And I think the, the only issue with that is you don't have the ads on there. So if you do need to like chop out stuff, it's not as, as beneficial, right? A lot of times that's for hammering stuff in. So it's like, how much time are you going to be using that hammer when you're, you're ski mountaineering, you know? Um, and yeah. I think the same question we go with like lightweight with ice axe, as we talked about with crampons is like, you know, going with something like that aluminum camp right there, as opposed to like a more durable ice axe is like that, that thing is just mainly used specifically for ski mountaineering, like in like, you know, without ropes and whatnot. Once you start getting into ice and stuff, you're going to want something a little bit more durable. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also, I, like I, when you're, when you're swinging, like uh, an ice tool is way heavier than an ice axe. Cause like when you're swinging the tool, you want some weight on there. Like imagine if you're framing, like using like a framing hammer versus a little like finishing hammer, like you want some more weight at the end to be able to get a good stick with your pick. For sure. And I mean, ice tool is something that we're going to be using more for like ice climbing, right? Yeah. Not, not necessarily for specifically for ski mountaineering. Cool. Perfect. What, um, what sizes uh, do you guys use and what, what, what is your act? What, what actual um, ice axe do you guys both use? Yeah, I use a version. It. I use a version of the one on the right there. I use a, the Petzl Ride. I think that's the Petzl Gully that we're looking at. But I use the Petzl Ride, which is like a little bit lighter weight version than that one. Yeah, I think I've got the Petzl Gully or the Ride as well. I'm pretty sure it's the Ride. And then I've also got the Camp one too, the Camp Ski Mountaineering one, which I use if I'm just kind of doing bootable stuff without any ropes or anything too crazy. Right. And so what are some common uses of an ice axe? I mean, what, you know, I think we even skipped, like, what is, why is someone going to carry, you know, one or two of these out into the backcountry? Um, so it started back in the day when people were walking on glaciers and it was before um, crampons existed. And so this is also where the ads came from on an ice axe where You'd be walking on a glacier, the ice axe would be super long, almost like a cane where you could touch the ground with it as you walk. And then um, it's just basically a third point of contact that you can use while you're standing up straight. And then if you got to a steeper section on this glacier, you could use the ads of the, of the ice axe and actually chop steps. And that was like a requisite skill back in the day to mountain travel was like the ability to quickly and efficiently chop steps. Um, and then as crampons gained popularity, the need to chop steps uh, lowered and the ice axe shortened because now instead of having a third point of contact, you actually have spikes on your feet. So your feet are more stable and you have less need for an ice axe on flat terrain. Um, and so they got shorter because as that terrain goes up and you're walking on that terrain, it's a shorter distance from your uphill hand to the ice or to the snow to have that third point of connection, right? And so if you think about ski mountaineering, uh, let's say we're like approaching a big couloir, we're gonna travel through flat terrain, we're gonna go up over some hills, down some hills, use our ski crampons, and then we're gonna get to the bottom of a couloir and we're gonna go up this like 45, 50 degree couloir. And once we get to that point, the snow is right in front of our face. And so you don't need this long ice axe anymore to add a third point of connection. So you can, you can do what's called a self belay, stick it in the snow as that third point of contact, a way to like grab the snow more or less as you move up. And then if you slip, you can go two handed on there and self arrest. 
to know you guys came here for an ice axe history lesson, did you? <laughs> yeah, and awesome. I think uh, I, was... I think coming down to it too as well is like, you know, I, I I think it also depends on your objective and like what ice axe you use, right? Um, I use like like the cane style a lot of times when I'm guiding on Shasta just because it's like super easy, right? Um, I see Laura's question there yeah. is like asking about the whippet, right? The whippet doesn't really serve us very well when we're trying to self-arrest, right? So if we end up in um, like knee, you know, knee deep into like some hairy territory or something, it's uh, it's not going to really serve a purpose as versatile um, as like an ice axe, right? So just something to keep in mind, like the, the whippet is great for certain uses, but it's not going to help us if we end up sliding and trying to like stop our fall kind of thing. Yep. And you're saying that because you can actually pull the telescoping parts apart, right, Trevor? Or is, do you have another reason for that? Yeah, I mean, it, it just like look at it, look at it. It's yeah. Super small, and I mean, I probably could break it against the wall. Yeah. My my thing with whippets is they're they're pretty heavy. Like, in in my mind, they make more sense for a skier than a snowboarder. Um. In terms of use case. For sure. Because your skier has got your poles in your hands all day and it's okay, but like as snowboarders, we're gonna pack our poles away and then you have this like heavy, sharp pole on your pack. You know, yeah. So. And that kind of brings me to, you know, when are these things appropriate to use? I, I have noticed a recent phenomenon um, on social media where I see people carrying these things, riding down and it often looks like they don't need them or, you know, or it's they're not in a, an area where they might need to self rest. Maybe that's just the angle, I don't know, but you know, what is your advice on carrying these things? Can you stop yourself if you slip and end up on your butt? That's the number one thing. All right. And that's yep. like how we move through terrain. And so the question just came in. A guide also taught me to use collapse poles upside down when climbing a cooler. Totally. Right. And he, he prefaced this with when the surface isn't icy, um, instead of the ice axe. So like, in my mind, are we climbing in something soft, like soft snow? Are you in soft snow? You could fall over and you're not gonna go anywhere. Like use your ski pole, so that's all good. You don't need an ice axe. Uh, are you on firm spring snow? And if you slip, you'll be able to stop yourself with an ice axe by digging it in. Then it would be appropriate to use an ice axe. And then lastly, like, are you on ice? where it might be like moderate ice, maybe like 30 to 40 degrees. And like, if you slipped, would you be able to self arrest? And if the answer is no, then you should be using a rope. For sure. And I think like you get to certain sections or something, you might have your ski poles if you're on skis, right? And then you realize that maybe, oh, this section's a little icy, icier than what we had before. I'll probably just throw one of my poles in my backpack, keep one of my poles out and have my ice axe in my other hand, right? because a lot of occasions we see people going down the hill and, and they have their ice axe in their hand because it looks cool or whatnot. But, you know, a lot of times it's more of a hazard than anything. So you really want to make sure that, you know, if you're skiing down that you're, you're kind of like judging, like, is this terrain worthy of me having my ice axe? Is this slide for life? If I slide and what's the consequence here? Like, yeah, if there's a bunch of cliffs below you, maybe you shouldn't even be in that zone, but I'm definitely going to have my ice axe. And like Will is saying, it's like might even be on a rope too. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, so now kind of climbing gear, we're getting into the meat of it. You know, we're going a little long, so we'll kind of try to get through this stuff and get to questions as quick as we can. But I'll let you guys, you know, just discuss the, the basic climbing gear that, that you're going to want when you're getting into, you know, maybe rappelling into a line or crevasse travel. Um, take it away. Uh, I'm just looking at Laura's question here real quick. Sorry. Yep. No worries. So first off, Laura, there's no stupid questions. That's why y'all are here. Um, if you're on ice and you should be roped up, do you get off? So I'm thinking like if we're climbing, uh, let's say like Mount Shasta or Mount Baker and we're a steep section where it's really firm and icy, we would have our skis on our backpack and be in crampons with an ice axe. And so depending on how steep the terrain is, I would start to rope up and then a lot of times when you're ski mountaineering, like in the morning, it will be too firm to get an edge in on your ski or board. But then by the time you're riding it later in the day, it'll be edgeable. So it's kind of like 
you're trying to hit this moment in time to find good conditions on the way down by uh, dealing with the more hazardous conditions on the way up. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Yeah, and, and if it's too if it's too crazy, you're, you're placing gear, right? And you're putting ice crews in and, or pickets or something like that, right? Um, or know, wondering so. why the hell we're here yeah. and we should bail. Exactly, <laughs> definitely. That's a good thing for sure. Yeah. Um, cool, climbing gear. Um, I would, I, I was thinking about this slide last night in terms of gear. And if you're gonna be doing rock climbing, you should know the gear that you need. And in, in bringing that to like a ski mountaineering application, like you shouldn't be rappelling for the first time in a ski mountaineering situation, as my opinion, right? Like go practice on a easy slab in the summer when it's not cold and the ropes are dry and it's all good. Um, but if I'm bringing climbing gear, it's gonna be my standard like racked up kit. So harness rope, uh, anchor gear, whether that's cordelette or pitons, and then rock protections like cams, nuts, ice screws, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And I think uh, we, yeah. like, yeah, talking about like the harness here, like we have this, it's like, you're, you're definitely going to have a different type of harness for glacier travel as opposed to, or alpine travel, ski mountaineering, as opposed to your rock climbing. Um, you know, that's a lot bulkier. So a lot of times, like, you know, when you're doing ski mountaineering, you, you want something that's a little bit lighter. It'll serve the purpose. Yeah. I threw this picture in there because that's, I'm wearing like a super lightweight schemo harness and yeah you're like, like what trevor yeah i'm like yo will where's your ice axe for that that mellow terrain you probably should have your ice axe out right <laughs> ice axe is stowed safely on the backpack um a big thing with the harnesses and ski mountaineering terrain and any mountaineering terrain really is you want to be able to put the harness on without stepping through the leg loops so like in this harness picture on the left that number four you have these little like buckles that you can undo and the waist belt actually comes fully undone. So you can have skis or snowboard or crampons on and you can put it on like a skirt basically and tie it up and not have to lose your footing in order to put it on. Awesome. Definitely. Yeah. I, I wholeheartedly this is, agree uh, with that. Like definitely want something that either buckles in or um, it's just so much easier to have something like that um, in the uh, splitboarding realm. Yeah, it's a great tip. Awesome. Rope. That's all you will. Sorry, I uh my internet's kind of whack. I missed it. Oh, I, I we we're talking about ropes. It kind of gets ah. kind of crazy here. So I was like, you can take this if you want. You, so this is like my my pinnacle moment of rope management, that picture right there. <laughs> <laughs> I took like five friends up this climb in Yosemite. I was proud of that. So thought I'd share it here. Um, so yeah, just like everything else, there's a million choices in the gear that you use. Um, I would say 90% of the time, I actually carry a, a rope in my pack as a rescue rope. And it's a static like haul line that's short, 30 meters. And that's like, if I need to, uh, build a sled or drag someone, I can use that rope. Um, but kind of big picture, we have static and dynamic climbing ropes. And then static just doesn't move. It doesn't stretch at all. A dynamic rope, if it's built for climbing, is going to have ratings on it. And you're going to have single rated, half rated, twin rated, and uh, you can have multiple ratings for a rope as well. Um, and it's just specific use cases for that type rating. Um, and then I think the biggest thing and kind of the theme throughout has been like, know your terrain and know where you're going and know what to expect, right? So like what rope am I, am I gonna pick for the day is depending on the objective that I'm after for the day. 
And like, can I split that rope into two people so that the team's carrying it? Or do we need like one long 70 meter rope and we can like shuffle some kit between the, the crew? Um, diameter from Jordan. I have, I think the rad line's like six mils. So super skinny. And that's what I carry on glaciers. And that's what my um, static line is in my pack. Um, rope, like single ropes are getting smaller and smaller. But I think ultimately your question should be, am I gonna use this rope on rocky terrain or is it gonna be on snow and ice? If it's gonna be on rocky terrain, it should be a fatter diameter. If it's gonna be on snow and ice, you can drop the diameter of that rope just because of the, the fatter ropes got more abrasion resistance, less likely to get cut. And it is possible to cut a rope, so. You want to make I think it's also dependent too on how many people you're rolling on that rope with too as well, right? Yeah. Especially when we're dealing with crevasses and whatnot, um, you need to make sure you have enough rope to help get someone out of a crevasse if they fall into, right? So, um, but yeah, I totally agree with you. Bigger diameter if you're, you're dealing with a lot of rock and ice um, as opposed to just like kind of going up snow. All right. Yeah. So is it safe to assume you um, don't like, you know, a static rope for repelling, for instance, so you're not bouncing around a bunch or crevasse rescue versus, you know, where rock climbing, you might have, you know, you almost always have a dynamic rope. Yeah. So crevasse rescue, definitely want a static rope because if you imagine you're building a, a, a hall system that's using mechanical advantage, um, if that rope stretches, you're losing power in each pole that you put in to bring your partner up, right? So if you have a static rope, it's a more efficient way to extricate your partner. Um, now, if you're, you could think of it as like go, going top down or bottom up, right? So like top down would be a crevasse rescue. Our buddy goes into a hole and from the top, we toss a rope down, hook him up and bring him back up, right? Also top down would be repelling. Um, I don't know. So any like top down scenario, you could use a static rope and be fine. Yep. Any bottom up scenario, you're gonna want a dynamic rope if there's any chance of falling. Because- And, and I think, Will, you're kind of getting a little bit, um, you're like digging in super deep here. It's like, you're probably, you're not gonna be carrying all that stuff with you, right? You're gonna probably have just a dynamic rope, I'm, I'm assuming for the most part, right? For sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And like, it really depends on your quiver. Right. And like, as you get more into it, like I've got more ropes than I know what to do with, you know, <laughs> do them have like their own little use case. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think, uh, you know, for those that are getting into it, keeping a dynamic, a dynamic rope is going to serve most of those purposes. Right. Um, okay. you're not going to probably want to bring more than, than one rope up. Right. Unless you have yeah. multiple teams. So just something to kind of keep in mind there. Yeah, perfect. Actually, perfect. I learned something last year for glacier travel that I, I'd like to share. And basically, we like went out ski touring on this big glacier. And we had a crew of like, there were two groups, uh, four and four. And we actually, the plan was to split into two groups for the day. And each group carried two ropes with them throughout the group. So like, if you imagine you're skiing down with that group, if the person with the rope goes into a hole, the whole team's kind of screwed. So like making sure you have a rope at the front and the back or in the middle of the squad is really important. Definitely. And that that's where coming, like having like two rad lines or two smaller diameter, diameter ropes will, will be super beneficial. Perfect. Well, speaking of rad lines. Yeah, Matt, just dialing in that kit, you know? knowing your gear and practicing with it, I think is really important. Yeah, I mean, this is a perfect example of what you're gonna have in your glacier travel kit, like your quiver, um, having that T-block and like the locking carabiners, um, some non-locking carabiners, micro-traction prusik, having some cordelette to be able to make like um, an anchor if you need to, and having like a rad, rad line rope. And, and like Will was just saying, having two per team, right? Um, having uh yeah just that's kind of like i think kind of molding that 
uh, the more you get into the back country, but I think like this is kind of like the uh, system that you're probably going to want to have with the, with some add-ons as well. Pop quiz for the people listening in. Can anyone tell us what the mechanical advantage is on that rad line system right there? And just held it, Lindsay, three to one. Does anybody know another name for that? Yeah, Z Poly, nice. You guys are dialed. I don't even know why you're tuning in. We're rookies out here. <laughs> Just lost your jobs, Will. Oh no, it's cool. I'm good at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Do you guys want to describe like what each one of these pieces is for, maybe really quick? Just for the people that maybe don't know all those awesome things. Yeah, you want to go for it, Trevor? Yeah, for sure. So we got the micro traction at the top there. Um, a lot of times we can use that for pulling people up, right? In a situation, it's just one direction, right? So um, in a situation where we have to do a rescue, we could set that up at the top with an anchor, um, drop that. And then you see down there, we've got the T-block um, just kind of linked up to the carabiner and that can be used kind of like a prusik, right? Um, and so that helps us to get progress capture as we pull someone up. And kind of in this situation, we're imagining that the person uh, that we're doing a rescue on is at the bottom there and that that carabiner there sweet awesome and yeah this kit comes with rope correct yeah and that's that ski mountaineering specific rope as well right the yeah, bag, the bag is, is what it's held in for sure and you could use it as a throw bag also i don't know if there's any river folks out there but um <laughs> you could use it as a throw bag sweet and boom overnight gear yeah, I mean, I think like this is also depending on what you're doing. I think a lot of times when you get into spring touring, there's no, um, there's not a ton of need to have a four season tent unless you know you're going to be getting into weather. A lot of times when I'm up on Shasta, I just do the the black diamond first light and that seems to serve the trip. But um, understanding like, you know, where you're going, what type of bag, uh, sleeping bag you want, like if you're going to be going into like a wet territory, I think synthetics a lot better than down, right? I feel like, um, down serves a purpose when it's really cold, but if you're getting into those wet environments, it can it can uh, make it, you know, it's not as beneficial, I guess, depending on the fabric that's around it. Um, yeah, then just making sure you have like a lightweight stole, the stove, um, always having headlamp, camp booties are super nice because that gets you out of your gear and allows you to kind of dry your your um, boot liners for the day. But a lot of my, you know, friends will will usually, not bring booties because it's an extra thing, but I'm always bringing booties just because it's so clutch, um, as Matt Scott said there. I, I, I bring that into the backcountry all the time just because I think it's just so much better to have to be able to get out of my boots for a little while. Camp, camp booty pro tip, you can take a uh, old set of skins and trim out the bottom, the footprint of your camp booty and like epoxy them onto your booty and uh, that way, when you're walking on snow, you got grip. Yeah, I like I like the OR booties. Yeah, OR. Tier Designs up. makes one too as well. It's pretty nice. And I think North Face. I think those are the three ones that I mainly know about. Also, like maybe TMI, but I get really sweaty feet. So if I'm doing an overnight trip, like the sooner I can get out of my ski boots for the day and start drying them, the more the happier I'll be tomorrow. For sure. And I'm one of those people that brings extra socks too, because I have super sweaty feet. So I'll usually have a, a pair of socks that I designate for my camp time and then ones that I let dry out with my boots. So same. Nice. Um, you guys have any specific uh, tent you recommend or uh, sleeping bags, any specific items that you guys carry or can't live without other than your booties we've established? Um, I really like my pyramid tent for spring missions. Um, it's on the next slide, but we can stay here for a minute. Um, and then, you know, just like some good snacks when you're camping. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Um, I like, uh, I have the MSR dragonfly, which I use for all season. But like I said, usually a lot of times in the springtime, the first light is super lightweight. I, I usually just bring that out, um, when I'm out in the springtime. And then um, I think like the Mountain Hardware Phantom uh, 
sleeping bag is, is super good sleeping bag. I, I use that quite a bit. Cool. Um, so. I so think. liners. Pick up. Yep. Pyramid tents. What's your pro tip? Tea steak? Uh, with the soak liners? Yeah. Yeah, usually I'll just stick it uh, like either in between my sleeping bag and my um, kind of like my sleeping bag and my sleeping pad usually. Or, you know, if if I'll stick it at the bottom of my sleeping bag, I guess it depends how wet they are. If they're super wet, I probably don't want my sleeping bag getting wet. So I'll stick them underneath like my sleeping pad in between my sleeping pad and sleeping bag. Yeah. Um, I learned a really good trick. It's more for like really extended trips, but you bring a uh, non-insulated metal water bottle with you. And when you're cooking dinner, you put boiling water into the metal um, water bottle and then shove that water bottle into your, you can actually put a, so a wet sock on it and then put that in your boot and the heat will dry your socks and your boots from that. <laughs> Pretty cool trick. Um, and then also, if you see in the top right picture, I hung my stinky boots up in the middle of the tent there and like kind of cook under them and you like can let the sun through the uh, pyramid tent kind of bake them and really yeah. do whatever you can do. And you could you could sleep with them too, Justin, just ask that that question. They, like they will dry your, your body too. Like a lot of times I'll go to sleep with like a little wetter socks too and try to like get them dry. Mm -hmm. um, just from my body and from the sleeping bag. But it, once again, it depends how wet it's all, it all is. Yep. Yeah. So I just wanted to share this picture of the pyramid setup. Oh, sorry, Ben, go back there for me. Yep, go for it. Um, so this is like, if I'm staying at a base camp for a period of time, this is typically how I set up the pyramid tent where I have on my probe, a mark for the um, the footprint of my tent. And so I can lay the probe down and mark the corners of my tent. And then we like stomp out a platform and then dig this little like U-shape with a bench in there. And it's super cush to hang out on the bench, cook dinner on the little table and um, just hang out really. But, tell everyone to beat it when you wanna to go to bed. Yeah, exactly. You got the party tent. So you gotta watch out for that. <laughs> Um, also like this night was pretty funny. It like was starting to get windy and we're like, oh, we'll be fine. Like we don't need to build a wall or anything. And then if you go to the next picture, there Ben, it was a pretty brutal night and we had spin drift coming under the pyramid tent the whole night. And we were just like getting smoked the whole time. And it was brutal. <laughs> sounds like a and, like a like a beginner intro to splitboard mountaineering right there that's right man it was definitely a beginner move and i was wishing i was in a first flight epic yeah um so you know you can have like really miserable moments and then you have these like really serendipitous nice awesome amazing moments when you're in mountains overnight I always struggle to do an overnight trip. And then once I do it, I'm psyched. All right, quickly, we'll jump into packs and uh, we're almost here at the end gang. Thanks for sticking with us. We really appreciate it. I know we're going a little over our hour, hour and a half uh, projected time. So stick with us. We're almost done here. Um, anything you guys want to add specifically on packs that maybe you, you want to look for in features? other than maybe just a little bit larger volume than your typical day pack? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is making sure you have a big enough pack. I, I, I know that I see a lot of people coming with too small packs and then you can't fit everything in there. So I always err on the side of going bigger. Like I think like 30 to 40 liters, great. Um, a lot of times when I'm just touring in the back country, I've got a 45 liter volume. But I think, you know, when it's changes, once you start doing multi-day trips, right, you're kind of starting to get into that 60 um, to maybe 75 liter pack. Um, but like, don't skimp on like not bringing a first aid kit or any of that stuff. You, you really want to make sure that you're comfortable. At least that's my mindset. Um, and then also making sure that you have an area where you can attach your split board or your skis onto that backpack, as well as an ice axe too. It's, that's super clutch because... Um, you don't want a lot of stuff dangling off your bag. You want the majority of it in your bag. Um, 
So that's what I like to say, keeping it classy, you know. No, no gypsy caravans. No, no gypsy caravans. Too many yeah. Nalgenes that have om I've almost taken to the face from, from sure. people climbing above me. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So uh, let's dive into those questions here, gang. Uh, feel free to just start knocking them out here and then we will um, bid all these wonderful people a good night. Heck yeah. Awesome. I'm just scrolling up right now. Uh, Packs for overnight trips. I like, um, I got the Osprey Mutant last season that I like a lot. It's kind of like a mountaineering specific overnight pack. They make a few different sizes. Um, I've struggled to find good packs. Backpacks are like the piece of gear that I've never satisfied with. Cool. Um, looking back, I see James Johnson had the question, how do you define moderate angle terrain versus steep ascents? What slope angles does it vary by conditions? Uh, what's the progression exact terrain of skinning to skinning versus ski cramponing to booting with ski crampons? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like kind of like similar to how we uh, gauge avalanche train, right? A lot of times steep ascents, I would, I, would, I would throw them in like that 35, 45 degree and above. Um, a lot of times, you know, you kind of are the, the terrain will dictate when you're putting your ski crampons on, but a lot of times I like to try to gauge it before I'm going to put my boot crampons on. Cause it's, it's really, really tough to like switch into, um, ski crampons when you're on a super steep terrain. So a lot of times like gauging that terrain ahead of time, um, can be super beneficial and judging like the terrain and saying, Hey, it's time for us to put our boots boot crampons on now uh, as opposed to waiting when we're on a super steep slope so yeah hopefully that answers your question james uh skins i really like pomoka skins that's all i have now yeah i'm i'm on board there too i think montaigne makes some pretty good skins as well i've always liked the black diamonds too but i think like used to be you get a bad batch and it seems like nowadays they're a lot more consistent for sure um we got zach Tuesday, gilbert i'm gonna What's ask up? you a question here on a huge multi-day mission how do you replenish water do you have to get out the stove and melt snow yeah for sure definitely and, yeah. and, a, and a little pro tip is make sure you have water in there so you don't burn the snow because it's actually possible to burn snow so yeah. so i'm say, like scrolling down from the the questions here so um zach had a question if time allows uh if only one set of AT skis, any guidance on balancing lightweight for ups and versus stability performance for the descent? Um, I, I'd say just trying to find a, a versatile ski that can kind of do both, right? Like I, I have like 106, uh, the QSTs, which I feel like are really awesome for touring and stuff. But I have like a, um, the zero G, Blizzard zero Gs for like kind of my mountaineering, spring mountaineering ski. So I think, finding something around that like underfoot that's like 99 um, or 90, like that can be super beneficial, but it's hard to kind of have just a one ski that's super versatile. And, and I think that like, for me, I think the Blizzard um, Zero G is a, a good one for that. I hear those say, Western guys are, are working on a, a mountaineering inspired ski too, 95 underfoot called the Skyline. Oh. We'll be out next year. So you guys uh, keep a look out for that ski. Love to try I would say if, if you only have one ski though, do a ski that you want to ski every day and don't worry about the weight. And then when you have the experience or the dough to get a second set of skis that are lighter and touring specific, you'll crush on them. Yep. Definitely. Um, what else we got? Uh, Laura asked what company we guide with. Um, I got sense. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think Will, you had said, I mean, we both guide with Golden State Guiding. Um, and then uh, we both guide with Alpine Glow as well. Um, I guide with Tahoe Mountain School, Alpine Ascents, and uh, a couple other ones as well. Yeah. Um... Cool. Any other questions that we missed? I, think I, I like James Johnson's Feathered Friends shout out. That's uh, Feathered Friends are awesome. That's my yeah. favorite band. 
it's the bee's knees. Cool. Uh, I think just to close it out, like with ski mountaineering and with footboarding and ski touring and the whole thing, like see it as a lifetime activity and see it as a thing that you can always build on and uh, enjoy the process and build the progression and ride to ride another day. For sure. I agree with that, Will. I mean, I think like one thing that you got to keep in mind is it's always awesome to, to ski gnarly lines and stuff, but just making sure that you're not stepping too far out of your comfort zone and you're being honest and transparent with yourself. Because I know that when I first got started, I ended up in a lot of scary situations, right? And um, we don't want to like deviate from the norm too much, right? We want to kind of like make sure that we stay in our wheelhouse and, and don't get in too deep. So that, that would be my um, knowledge for, for beginners getting into like the splitboard mountaineering or ski mountaineering is just, just make sure you're taking one step at a time. Absolutely. Well, Trevor, Will, thank you guys so much for um, that awesome, awesome chat about ski mountaineering. That was um, easily one of my favorite episodes. I learned a ton. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call learned a ton. Um, this episode will be on YouTube, will be on our website if you guys want to rewatch it. If you have any questions for us, don't be afraid to ask. You can always email us info at Western Backcountry or gsg.info at Golden State Guiding. Um, you know, the, these guys, uh, feel free to give a shout out of your Instagram, uh, accounts as well. If you guys have questions, you know, you could probably reach out to them there. If you have some other way, um, that you want them to hit you up, feel free to drop that information there in the chat. Um, and yeah, thanks again for everybody for tuning in. Definitely, um, check out the, you know, upcoming episodes. We're, we're trying to do one a month. Um, this one will be hard to follow though. You guys crushed it. So Thanks again so much for tuning in, everybody, and uh, we'll see you on the skin track. Thanks, awesome. Ben. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks for everyone who participated. Hopefully, you took a lot away from it. All right. Adios, gang. Have a good night. Cheers.